a singular chain like an Ethereum or even a Solana, et cetera, that by itself will not scale. So our belief is that as applications start to grow and we get more user traffic, scale becomes a very significant issue for these applications. And the only way in which they're able to accommodate that traffic is to be able to scale horizontally. We would need to automate chain deployment for you, which we have done. The way that we stand up our chainlets is every time a developer requests a chainlet, then our validators are obligated to automatically spin up a chain for them that has the same security model and the same validator set as our mainnet. So first of all, we wanted to completely abstract away the chain creation and chain deployment process. Now, it's so easy to spin up one. Why not spin up multiple? Welcome to Epicenter the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix Lutsch, and today I'm speaking with Rebecca Liao, who is the co-founder of Saga. Saga is a layer one network that allows developers to spin up dedicated chainlets, app chains dedicated to their specific use case. Before we talk with Rebecca, we'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain, or a business looking to white label the stack, visit gnosispay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at gnosis.io. Cars 1 is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Hi, Rebecca, and welcome back on Epicenter. Great to have you again. Great to be here, Felix. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, you guys lucked out. This is the very last podcast that we'll do before Mainnet launch. Um, and we're obviously not releasing until after Mainnet launch. So um, yeah, quite a bit of rich information I can tell you today. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time in this probably super busy day. So one of the busiest days in Saga history. I'm, I'm sure we can dive into like, you know, what, what you learned over the last year since you last came on. So for our listeners, Rebecca was on, I think, I guess April last year, maybe almost a year ago, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And so we talked a lot about kind of Saga's architecture and like sort of the core value proposition there. Um, I, it was much earlier days than today, I'm sure. So, um, but yeah, anyway, so maybe you can, we can kind of start by talking a bit, a little bit about, you know, the high level of, of Saga, what it is for the people that didn't listen to the first episode and, and who you are, maybe, maybe we can start there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Felix, it's great to see you again. Um, it's always great to spend time with you guys. The Epicenter is definitely one of our favorite podcasts. Um, so I did one miss this for sure. Yeah, so Saga is a layer one. Um, but we are a layer one to launch other layer ones. Uh, so everything that is built on Saga is by definition on their own chain or set of chains, which we call chainlets. And why do we architect it this way? It was for infinite horizontal scalability. So our belief is that as applications start to grow and we get more user traffic, scale becomes a very significant issue for these applications. 
And the only way in which they're able to accommodate that traffic is to be able to scale horizontally. Uh, and so at a high level, that is what Zaga is. We are costless on the front end. So we're very careful to, um, to specify that we're costless as opposed to gasless. So it's blockchain. Um, anytime that you're dealing with a chain, there's no such thing as no gas. I mean, you can set gas to zero, but um, we don't advise it. And I think uh, any any sort of like blockchain engineer architect out there will advise you against that, even though it's very tempting. So instead, we have a system um, by which your transactions on the front end remain costless. It's true that Saga does not show up on the front end. We do not charge a gas fee to the end user. Saga token is used by developers to pay the validators to keep our chains alive. So um, given all of that, it is a system that is optimized for consumer adoption. In terms of uh, what I've been working on, I mean, running this project has been uh, quite insane. I would say it's probably one of the most insane things that I've ever worked on. I mean, before this, I did another crypto startup with Zaki. Um, that was more in the DeFi space. And then before that, I did an AI startup. And uh, things have definitely changed in that field. I mean, back then, natural language processing was impossible. And I mean, now it's table stakes, right? People don't really think about it anymore. As it's, it's been incredible to, to see the journey over time of just what technology sees as the next frontier. But this is the most exciting thing to be working on um, at the moment, for sure. And uh, yeah, I, I'm thrilled going into main at launch. Yeah, that's awesome. There's a, there's a lot to dive in there. Maybe even a little bit the AI use case, we can, we can see if, if Saga returns to its origins. Uh, but maybe we can start, like you mentioned, yeah, infinite horizontal scalability. I guess we have had a lot of infrastructure projects on here. I think that's kind of like one of Epicenter's focuses in, in some ways, and maybe also like blockchain overall focus, since we didn't have that many consumer apps yet. How do you, yeah, I guess compare to like other infrastructure projects that like, like, like I don't know, new stuff like shared security restaking, modularity, how how do you feel Saga fits in there? What differentiates from like maybe other infrastructure products? Yeah, so I I would put it this way. You know, it's, it's always interesting how these tech narratives pop up in crypto um, because the fact of the matter is you can discuss endlessly until you actually have to deliver a product. And so at Saga, you know, we look at all these different things, whether it's restaking, um, shared security. I mean, they're kind of the same thing. Um, so every protocol has different ways of doing it, but they're all getting at the same idea, which is that a singular chain like an Ethereum or even a Solana, et cetera, that by itself will not scale. And so the way that you are able to, to scale at something that's existing or how you're able to build a system or scalability from the beginning is you're able to accommodate for additional block space. So you need to be able to provision with new block space. And the way that some protocols do it is by you know restaking from another chain that's completely foreign to them um, to their own set of chains. Um, at Saga, everything is native. So there is a Saga mainnet. Um, it has a set of validators. It is a fully decentralized proof of stake Cosmos chain. The way that we stand up our chainlets is every time a developer requests a chainlet, then our validators are obligated to automatically spin up a chain for them that has the same security model and the same validator set as our mainnet. So it is definitely shared security. Can you call it restaking? Sure, you can call it restaking um, because we're taking the validator stake from the mainnet and then applying it to a chainlet. You can call it modular as well, because we're definitely not doing a singular L1. Uh, we are an L1 specifically to proliferate L1s. But at Saga, I think that um, our experience is app developers can get quite confused by all of these options, especially because A, they have to understand what the technology does, and then B, they have to understand what the significance is for them. And uh, we tend to want to cut to the chase here. Um, and so we tell the app developers, you want scale. At the end of the day, if you are a game, for instance, which is our main focus, you are looking for scale. Because the fact of the matter is, you know, game designers are creatives. Felix, I don't know if you're a gamer, but I'm sure you've played lots of games throughout the years. Uh, they are creatives. And so they have a creative vision in their head. And most of the time, the technology is nowhere near capable of meeting that creative vision. Um, and so what we're trying to do at Saga is to get you as close to that creative vision as possible. So if you wanted to create an MMORPG, for instance, with lore, thousands of characters, all of whom are NFTs, 
interoperable assets, you should be able to do that. We don't want the base infrastructure to constrain your game design, in other words. So um, that's how we think of it is, yes, there are these tech narratives. And honestly, some of the, the best researchers and brightest minds in this space are working on those narratives. And so, of course, we pay attention. But at the end of the day, our focus is the end user. It is the app developer, the game developer in particular. And when we build our product, it is really with them in mind. Right. Yeah. Super interesting. And yes, I am like so many, like even Vitalik, old school World of Warcraft gamer. <laughs> that <laughs> Oh, really? Uh, there you go. You understand. <laughs> you understand. It's like, yeah. where the hell did my skins go? Yeah, you understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think one of the first articles I wrote about like why blockchain and gaming works back in the day was actually about like sort of these portability of the assets or the power of the the game over your assets and stuff. So interesting to see we're we're probably hopefully soon actually getting there that the scale is possible to to really build a blockchain game. So yeah, super curious to hear more about that. Like you're you're saying you're focusing specifically on the gaming use case. Can you or like I, I guess also app developer perspective can you describe a bit how how you do that in practice and how you like abstract stuff from them that the, that the blockchain does or or things like that yeah so first and foremost i i think um and and this is not a small thing i mean it's um it's one of those things where i think in the roll up discussion it's become um sort of a, a more muted part of the conversation but i think it's important to remember which is that building a chain is not easy um, so what are the components of a fully decentralized proof of stake chain? First of all, you need a validator set. And um, that means that you need to be a project that can be profitable for validators. And that already cuts out most of the applications out there, especially when they're first starting out. And so having your own chain um, prior to Saga was an enormous lift. So that's the first thing that we wanted to solve for developers is if you want your own dedicated block space, which is your ticket to actually scalable infrastructure, then um, we would need to automate chain deployment for you, which we have done. Um, so right now in our web app, honestly, you fill out five parameters for your chain um, and then our validators will take about a minute to sync. Um, and then all the services around the chain will have to be spun up. So the indexers, the RBC endpoints for sure, the block explorers, once that is done, um, the whole process is maybe about a minute and a half. You have your own chain and you can have as many of these as you like. So first of all, we wanted to completely abstract away the chain creation and chain deployment process. Now, it's so easy to spin up one. Uh, why not spin up multiple? Um, because at the end of the day, one chain should be enough for most applications to start off with. But if you are a large game, for instance, that is built on another system and you are looking for a scalable solution now, then you have a lot of users and a lot of assets that are already built in. You're already starting to think about multiple chains. Um, so if, you like, if you're a WoW player, then you know all about game instances, game shards, different realms. And this is how game developers like to organize their game. Um, so it starts to expand onto multiple chains, but it'll still feel like the same application. Um, so it's actually quite similar to cloud in that sense, um, because you probably start off with one AWS instance um, or a couple. And as the compute resources you require increase, then you would expand to as many instances or servers as you as you can. So it's the same idea on Saga, just expand to multiple chains if you need that additional performance. Um, because we're all familiar with Cosmos, I can start a little differently on this point, uh, which is that IVC allows all these chainlets to speak to one another. Um, so there is complete interoperability within the Saga ecosystem. Now, bridging out to other ecosystems this is also where it gets interesting. I would say that with most solutions out there, whether it's um, rollups for sure, even other app chain or side chain solutions, bridging is an issue um, because the way that bridging usually works is you have a bridge provider. And um, even for the ones that are completely decentralized, there is still some way in which they will whitelist a chain. Um, and it's usually a BD effort. So you have to talk to the core team and um, get them to agree to open up the bridge for the assets that are coming from your particular chain. Now, um, for most layer ones or for um, any layer one prior to Saga, that was, I mean, it was a manageable effort because the number of layer ones was pretty finite. Um, but here we're going for infinite horizontal scalability. And honestly, any application developer should be able to just spin up chains whenever they want. 
And therefore, talking to the team every single time you're going to spin up a chainlet is not scalable. So we needed a way in which you can permissionlessly add um, our chainlets to the bridges and then open up bridging for the assets that are contained on those chains. So the fact that we are a fully decentralized proof of stake system with fast finality, that gets us to that fast bridging. And that's something that a lot of application developers are looking for as well. They just want to go where the liquidity is. We at Saga think that there is far more value um, that we can create in terms of being the hub for these application developers than in making sure that all the liquidity is locked on here. Um, as we know in technology, oftentimes if you are the easiest platform to use, then liquidity ha just happens to find you um, because that's where the user traffic and the developer traffic will go. Yeah, so um, those are some ways in which we're helping out developers. And then the costless transactions that I mentioned earlier, that is absolutely key. I think especially for game developers, um, many of them have aspirations to have their own token or uh, they are looking to maybe use a token of another ecosystem, even if they're coming to us from uh, an Ethereum community or a Polygon community, et cetera. And we allow for that kind of flexibility on the front end. So we don't interfere with the monetization, in other words, um, of these application developers with their end users. So yeah, the entire system has been really architected to maximize the experience for the app dev. And um, I think given the, the traction that we've seen so far, it's resonating. Yeah, thanks. That was a lot. Super interesting. And am I just understanding correctly that it's not like the assets you bridge have to go kind of through the Saga hub L1, but they can actually go straight from the chainlet to, to somewhere else? That's exactly right. So every chainlet is a chain. It is a fully decentralized proof of stake chain in its own right. Um, and so it's able to do everything that a layer one can do. The only difference really is that we don't require you to have your own token for staking um, because again, everything is, I, I guess you could say it's restaked from the Saga main chain. And so there's no need for you to have a staking token. Um, a lot of people will ask about staking regardless. And I think that's because maybe some validators have become important community members um, for these applications for, you know, for various reasons. And they want to be able to reward the validators or people who have been longstanding community members through the mechanism of staking. And it's true, staking is an incredibly powerful incentive mechanism. It's why many people attempt to stand up layer ones. But what we always tell people is, okay, I think it's it's time to change the mental model a little bit in that you don't have to have actual staking. You know, you don't need to secure the network per se, but you can have staking. Um, you can have people stake their assets in liquidity pools or with certain assets based on certain activity in your application. It's just you no longer have to worry about a staking token for purposes of security. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think, I guess that it's getting back a bit too because in the end, obviously the app chain developer needs to kind of pay for Zaga. So maybe that's also, uh, yeah, something we can talk about a bit. How does this pricing work? I know we probably talked about it last time, but we, we can probably go back into that yeah, so pricing is, um, no, thank you, Felix. It's a very important point. Um, pricing is a very uh, important vector for us. And the reason for that is, I think from the perspective of an application developer, gas is annoying, not just because it's potentially high, um, it's unpredictable. And so when you are trying to actually, you know, stand up a project, get some traction for it, you want to be able to know what the costs are, um, pretty basic. And I think for us, when we um, designed our tokenomics, uh, that's one thing that we really aimed for um, was some sort of understanding of what the cost is going to be for running one of these chains. Um, and we did not want it to be reliant on gas. So so here's a mechanism. We call it musical chairs. Every epic, which is about a day, we run a reverse auction among our validators. And um, the number of validator slots that we're starting off with is around 20. So 2021. And um, in order to get one of those slots, uh, the validators will bid their price for providing um, security for a chainlet for that particular day. And the lowest set of prices wins. So if you were in that lowest set of prices, that's great. You're part of the validating set. Um, the highest price in that winning set of prices is the price for that particular day. So if you're the validator who bid that, then congrats, you got exactly what you asked for. But if you are a validator that bit actually a little cheaper than that, so your pricing was even lower, then you actually get a nice margin over and above what you had originally anticipated, which is great. If you price too high, 
so you are out of the validating set for that particular day, um, then not only are you not validating, you're actually not getting the rewards for being a validator for that particular day that you're out of the set. And so this is an incredibly powerful mechanism to encourage validators to bid their true cost or as close to their true cost as possible for providing security for chains. Um, so what's the definition of that? It's, it's commodity pricing. So we aim to get to commodity pricing for our application developers. Now, um, what we're currently clocking in at is about $500 um, per chainlet per month. And given that there are no other fees in the system, um, that is probably the most affordable way in which an application can develop, uh, whether it's on a monolithic layer one or whether it's on other sidechain um, dedicated block space solutions. We aim to be the most cost effective. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Uh, and how did you actually like arrive at this cost? Because I guess that's you running it on testnet and validators already price in in like dollars their sort of cost or how does it actually work in practice yeah yeah no that's exactly right so for uh the test tests that we've run so far they are free of charge um they are free of charge and therefore um we are so we haven't actually put this mechanism into practice yet um that'll come in the phases of mainnet but what we did do with every test set was um, we had the full set of validators. So we had ourselves, so we were a validator, but um, we also invited in what anywhere from like 20 to 22 other validators to be a part of the test set. And so um, this entire time we are monitoring the collective cost basically of each uh, chainlet that is stood up. And um, for our Pegasus incentivized test net, which is um, our next to last testnet before mainnet. We actually, we have a testnet V2 that is running right now, but that's really for final verification purposes. No one's really meant to build or do anything on there. Um, the one that we had immediately before was Pegasus. And um, for that one, we, I think, maxed out at around 210 chainlets or so. So we had a lot of data to work with, in other words. So it's based on cost at the moment. It's based on cost. And the assumption here is that because of how we have architected this reverse auction, it should be the case that um, when validators do actually come online and participate, that the final pricing will be very, very close to the actual cost that they're paying. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, like curious to see how it like will look on mainnet and if it will turn out like that, I guess that will be the the big question. So like I saw, actually, I, I mean, yeah, you, you mentioned 210 uh, chainlets there on the Pegasus testnet. Like when you go to mainnet, how many do you expect to go live in the first few weeks? Do you have an idea or, or of, of how much it might be? Yeah, so our um, day one mainnet launch partners, there are over 100 of them. So, um, I mean, we have a Saga Innovator program. That's our ecosystem program. We've been building that for the last year and a half, two years. And that has 350 projects in it. Um, and so not everyone is going to come online day one, uh, but we definitely wanted to encourage as many people to get started as soon as possible. Uh, so it should be over 100. All right. Yeah, that's that's super exciting. Yeah, congrats. That sounds like a lot. I think I'm assuming a lot of them, given the core focus is games still, as, as I understand, are games. Um, can you talk a bit about... Yeah, is that like the main one? And then maybe yeah, how do you, yeah, what did you learn from these games or how, how, what sort of games are there? Like what excite you that, which games excite you? Yeah, how are you approaching these game developers, everything <laughs> in, in that sense? Yes, the vast majority are games. Um, some of them are going to be more pure NFT collections. So I would say 80% of our ecosystem is gaming. Um, and then about 10% is more pure NFT and entertainment. And then the remaining 10% is DeFi. So we are an L1 um, at the end of the day. And so there, there are always interesting things that you can do with respect to DeFi on an L1, especially here uh, where pretty much every single chainlet is going to have at least one token. So uh, that's, that ecosystem is actually, it's, it's starting to uh, gear up, which is very exciting to see. But in terms of the games, I would say that the kind of game that is really suited to Web3 is the kind of game that really relies on UGC. Um, so UGC is user-generated content. And um, the reason for that is a decentralized system, very frankly, is never going to beat what c kind of computing power AWS and NVIDIA combined can give you. Um, so if you're looking for a game that is meant to be you know, a fast-moving, high-performance 
completely optimized visual experience. Blockchain is not really meant for that. Blockchain, I hope, can support that kind of game, but it's not the base infrastructure for it. There are many other game infras and tooling for that particular kind of purpose. So what is it that Web3 and blockchain uniquely bring um, to a game? It really is that decentralized generation and control of intellectual property. Um, so what that means is if you are a mod for a game, not not a, a social mod as in a moderator, but if you modify games, for instance, then you are much more easily able to monetize that without ever having to consult the big studio or the original creator of the game. If you are a gamer and you're looking to customize your avatars or your skins, then this is a great way um, in which you can go ahead and do that and actually retain control and monetization of those assets. Uh, and so it's really those core things around ownership, creative freedom that is really suited to Web3 gaming. So the kinds of games that we seek out, they do tend to be um, pretty vast in vision. Um, so open worlds, MMORPGs, things that have lore. But we also are starting to see some like pretty, pretty fascinating genres come on board. Um, so survival, horror games as well. Um, some of the games that will come online immediately are things like Rogue Nation um, by Moonlit Games. There is um, a game called Another World, which is a classic RPG game. Um, there's a game called Star Heroes. It's like it's first person shooter, but it's set in space. Super fun game. Um, Eternity, which is kind of Fortnite, but on jetpacks. Um, there's a significant AI component to it. And um, so those are some of the ones I can come up with off the top of my head right now. Uh, but we also recently announced a game publishing arm at GDC called Saga Origins. And anyone can build on Saga. Anyone can build on Saga. But in terms of the games that we financially back and that really get the benefit of full publisher services, uh, including go-to-market, user acquisition, creating game awareness, community building, et cetera, all the things that a publisher generally does for games, um, it is a very specific kind of game. So we have a pretty clear creative point of view at Saga when it comes to origins. So we're looking for games that are provocative, expansive, and uncompromising. So these are the hardcore games. We're looking for that intensity of content. And um, why is that? Because again, we're looking for what is it that Web3 can uniquely bring, right? And um, I think E for Everyone games are terrific. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want a game that anyone and everyone from your like two year old cousin to your like, you know, 50 year old dad could play. That's awesome. But we think that Web3 is meant to push the envelope. We should be a home for that content that will not get accepted by big studios. And there's quite a lot of that right now. Games that are really great quality, um, but the content is just not acceptable for mainstream consumption. But as we know, uh, if you build something that is of great quality, it's a great product, and it resonates with people, it will find the mainstream. And so the games that we're starting off with for the publishing arm, they do tend to be a little bit more intense. They are def they're not E for everyone. They're definitely M games. And we just we think that we're going to carve out that pretty unique niche um, within Web3. And I mean, we're, we're already seeing an early play testing that people are really responding to, maybe a little too much, um, but it's, it's fun. It's, it's a fun process of discovery. Right. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds interesting. So, I mean, maybe a weird question here, like, I guess if these games are so intense, like, do you, do you have any concern that like validators might not want to run the infrastructure for it or something, or is that, or could you, are you addressing that somehow, or is that even... Let me let me put it this way. Um, so first and foremost, validators, the beauty of the Saga system is that so much is automated. So validators don't even have to know which chains are um, being run by them. If you are within the validator set of Saga, then your SLA is that you will um, automatically stand up and run whatever chain let comes your way um, for as long as you are a validator. So we've taken the, you know, the quote unquote choice aspect out of it, um, which just simplifies the whole thing for validators. Now, if you are, are, as a validator, are so offended by the content of certain games on Saga such that you don't want to be a validator anymore, well, then you are welcome to go on to Solana and validate some of these meme coins. And you know what I'm talking about. So, yeah, if censorship is your thing, then, you know, go with God. Right, right. Yeah, makes sense. Sounds, sounds, sounds fair. Super interesting. And so I think one thing I also wanted to talk about... I mean, first of all, like super interesting with the publishing house, how did you actually, like, so it's funded by Saga in, in a sense, and it's like its own like sort of business uh, and people like working on that. Yeah. Okay. That, that's super, 
it's very exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's not a separate entity right now. So it's still a part of the Saga of fourteen. Um, but we are starting to think about how do we like make it its own thing. Because, I mean, we are focused on gaming and entertainment as a chain to, to begin with. Um, most of the people on the business side at Saga um, have been sort of oriented towards games this entire time anyway. Um, so we're starting off the publishing house with just the core team working on it. But yes, as we grow, as we get more titles, um, as the demands for those titles become greater and greater, then I, I do think that we're going to hire out a specific team for that. Yeah, very interesting. Um, maybe also going to like this sort of test net learnings and kind of how it is for the validator side. I mean, I guess I have like a bit of a background there, so maybe that's why I'm interested in it. But yeah, how has that been for the validators? Have they, how much infrastructure are we actually talking? If you're like 210 chain lin chainlets, like how many, like how beefy are, are the machines or is it like all one machine or are they like provisioning separate infrastructure for this and... Yeah, I guess. Or what other learnings were there in the test net, maybe, aside from the price discovery there? Yeah, so I would say um, in terms of validator load, um, so, so far it's been it's been manageable. Um, in terms of how many machines a validator has to run in order to support one of these nodes, I think it has been quite manageable. Um, and we've seen that for our own validator as well. But the thing that we did learn, this was interesting, is oftentimes when people talk about scalability, they, they focus on things like TPS, for instance, you know, what... It, your block time, what's your time to finality settlement. Um, these are the things that people focus on. But what we learned um, is sort of midway through Pegasus Incentivized Tessa, that's when we ran a developer challenge. And we told um, developers who are part of the Saga Innovators, as well as outside developers, actually, we invited in the community, please pound the system, just pound the system with transactions and just because we want to see how it responds under great duress. And what we found is that the chain holds up. So the chain holds up, nothing wrong with validator operations. The chain holds up very well. It's actually the services around it that have a problem. So for example, the block explorers, um, even some of the RPC endpoints, indexers are, you know, they're sort of whatever for now, um, but definitely the block explorer, it was just not able to catch up. And uh, what I mean by that was when you spin up uh, a new chainlet and you're starting to paddle with transactions. I mean, the block explorer sort of has to come online at the same time and then keep up with the block production. And the explorer that we had been using at the time just was not able to do that. And any sort of failure of transactions as a result of the stress test, it was actually more due to the services um, surrounding the chain. And so that's when our engineers were like, this is, this is quite interesting to learn um, because in the journey to mainnet, they had been thinking, okay, we're just going to focus on making sure that the chain is entirely stable and secure. And that turned out to not be the issue. Um, so ever since that particular stress test and then leading into mainnet now, the engineers have really been focused more on the services. Um, so making sure that the services can be optimized and catch up with the production of blocks. That was the main learning. That was the main learning. And we're doing the best that we can right now, um, given the services that are available. And we don't produce any of these things ourselves. So we don't like have our own native block explorer, for instance. We have not built our own indexing service, but uh, we are doing our own service provider stack for RBC endpoints, um, just for node orchestration, because it's more complicated in our system than others, where every single chain has their own RBC endpoint. So if you are integrating with Saga, there's really no such thing. You're really integrating with individual chains. So yeah, I, I think it's optimizing for all of that. Um, that's that's a learning that came out of it. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, and it also gave us a good idea of what kinds of projects we want to back going forward, not necessarily in terms of games, but for growing the Saga protocol. So if you are a developer in the community and you want to contribute to this protocol, you're not a part of the core team, you know, what are some of the services that, that will finance, in other words, that will give grants to um, in order for you to just make this a lot stronger? But yeah, it was, it was fascinating. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. It's kind of like once you have real usage, you start to realize this like base layer is actually maybe, maybe like Comet BFT <laughs> is performing well, but uh, some other things are not. I guess even like in Ethereum, maybe in DeFi, you added a bit with like MEV and, and, and stuff there where that was probably also a similar realization. And so like these services are run not by like the validators or like the, I guess the RPC nodes who kind of provides them in the end or how are they 
part of the saga system at large uh, is there like also like some sort of economics around them or how do we how can i imagine that yeah at the moment at the moment it's a package at the moment it's a package i mean oftentimes these services are you know they're open source tools um they don't really have sort of a, an economic model to them as of yet um but having said that i i do think in the future what can happen we've sort of started to to plan for this already in the roadmap is that there's kind of a marketplace of tooling. Um, so here is a Saga chain led out of the box. Um, it has our validator set and security model. It has these set of services. And um, I um, I do think that there there is actually a, a packaging for the services, which we call the Saga OS. Um, so this is what every chain needs in order to run. Um, now, if any component of that Saga OS is something that you want to switch out, then that's entirely possible. Um, but it's not possible right now, but we would like for it to be possible in the future. So if you wanted to bring your own Block Explorer, for instance, if you had your own preferred in indexing service, then you can switch it out. If you wanted to switch out any particular component of the chain itself. So if you don't like the execution layer, you don't want to use EVM, you'd rather use SVM or some other kind of virtual machine. If you wanted to switch out our DA or somebody else's DA, that's also totally fine. So it really starts to be this like marketplace of developer tooling. You can see, by the way, that I've been describing the system that we've taken quite a bit of inspiration from the cloud. Because right now, if you are developing on AWS or Azure or whatever cloud service, then there is a very robust marketplace in which you can switch out particular tooling um, for your application, your website, whatever it is that you're hosting. Um, so we want it to be the same idea here. Now, what it does mean is that life gets more complicated for you um, as you start to switch out from the the main chain-led package. Um, then uh, if any of these individual services that you prefer are charging, then you have to bake that into the cost. And I mean, it may be the case that Saga does some sort of revenue share or some sort of package deal um, with these service providers. Those are individual deals that need to be negotiated out. But as of right now, it's, I think, for a mental model, the app developers just have to keep in mind that if you start to customize to that extent, then it's likely that your costs may, it, they'll start to vary. They'll just mark, it'll get more complicated. Right. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. I think, yeah. Interesting how to see that develop maybe in the long run, how much of that, yeah, marketplace can be like ha done through Saga or how it maybe integrates the protocol in the long run. I, I guess there's like a lot of things to think about there. Saga itself the, like you said, the has a mainnet or is L1, uh, has a chain. And I, I, I read a bit of an article where you kind of describe the rollout of the Saga mainnet. So, I mean, I'm probably a lot of people here are familiar with like how Cosmos chains generally are launched. Um, maybe can you explain a bit how how you're approaching this? Since I guess you have like all these different chainlets and there there's a bunch more complexity of how how this rollout needs to happen. So I, I found that pretty interesting how you're how you're doing that. Yeah. So I think um, in in the opinion of um, Jake McDormand, who is our brilliant co-founder CTO, um, and um, Bogdan Alexandrescu, who is our co-founder VP of engineering, I mean it's a massive system that we're building, something that is infinitely scalable on a horizontal vector. I mean, this is a system that can break down in so many ways. Uh, and so when we wanted to design the rollout for mainnet, we could just have it all exploded out there without a ton of user testing along the way, or we can do a phased rollout because what's going to come out, or maybe by the time that this airs, um, what has come out as our saga mainnet, it is a gated launch. Uh, and so it is a chain to launch chains. It's in layer one to launch other layer ones. But we are still um, keeping the, um, the security chain decentralized and then the platform chain itself, uh, it has a very simple task of just standing up these chainlets. Now, what happens through phases two through six of mainnet launch is that we start to add in some critical services like IBC. That is probably the most important one so that the chainlets can speak to one another. We'll also further decentralize the validator set as well. Um, and then by the time we get to full feature mainnet, version one, um, which will be in a few months from now, um, that's when we know that the system can scale in a really sustainable way, um, that all the chainlets can speak to one another. Uh, and we will have established some of those early bridges uh, that go directly from each of the individual chainlets as they are stood up out to other ecosystems and then out to their, say, NFT marketplaces or their DEXs as well. 
I think the reason why we wanted to roll it out like this is we know the kind of user traffic that we're going to deal with. And rather than risk everyone coming on at the same time and this whole thing just kind of exploding and the chain dying, let's go ahead and phase it out in a way such that it's very useful at every point, but it's still relatively safe. That was the thinking behind it. Um, yeah, so that that's the technical launch plan. Um, I, I think what's going to end up happening actually is even though we divided everything after phase one into five additional phases, we might start merging some of these. I think along the way, the engineers have learned, okay, there, there are some things that we can optimize for here. So yeah, um, it, it should be good the next few months yeah i think it's it's very very thoughtful already to have thought like this far and build like this plan i think in many ways we have seen many launches that kind of did it while the while it happened you know while the plane was flying so i think um this seems to be like a very thought through approach and i mean if you can optimize it more yeah that that's great right so um yeah pretty keen to see how how it will go down i guess yeah like you said hopefully once this airs or it might already be live. So yeah, best of luck <laughs> at this <Thank> moment. <laughs> yeah, I think, I guess to another point, which is also like a big part of the launch and especially nowadays in this market, the thing that people care about a lot, I guess is the Saga token itself and the token launch. You did have some interesting campaigns and like airdrops. I mean, I guess you were uh, building or focused on games. So gamification is also core to uh, your uh, business in some sense but yeah maybe can you explain a bit yeah the thinking behind like sort of the the allocations or how, how you conducted the airdrop yeah and then how it all worked first of all the airdrop criteria that you saw for the community is a result of several months of work um, on the part of our token team which is led by Jin Kwan our, our co-founder chief strategy officer and uh, the goal was to really encourage loyal, long-term community members and uh, within a Cosmos system that's evidenced by staking. So we wanted to target the most loyal stakers. And um, in terms of sort of narrowing in the, on the subset of stakers and how the budget will be allocated between them. So we wanted to target um, roughly 200,000 wallets. That was our goal. That was the ceiling for this particular campaign. Overall, for airdrops, we have allocated 20% of our total token supply, but that is going to be airdropped out over the entire life of the project, not necessarily just for Genesis. For our Genesis drop, we wanted 6%. And um, among that 6%, we wanted to reserve about 4% for those stakers. Um, so knowing that and knowing that we wanted to target roughly 200,000 wallets overall, that's when we started to look at the ecosystems that are of interest to us. So obviously Cosmos is a big one. That is the ecosystem that we came from. Um, it underlies our core technology. So we wanted to reward Cosmos stakers for sure. Um, we wanted to reward Celestia stakers. Celestia is our first major partner. Our partnership was formed, God, like maybe 14 months ago or so, uh, a long time ago. And um, ever since then, I mean, we've been working together incredibly well, and the team has pulled off amazing technical feats. So we definitely wanted to reward their stakers. Um, Polygon and Avalanche were the two other major tech partners for us. So for Polygon, we automate CDK chains for them. And for um, Avalanche, we automate Avalanche subnets. Um, so CDK chains, subnets, these are both also ideas of dedicated block space. Um, but the reason why they um, are just, they're harder to stand up is that it's still a very manual process. And one thing that Saga really excels at is that automation. So those two ecosystems have also been very supportive of us. The leadership teams for sure have been incredible to Saga. So we wanted to reward them and we wanted roughly the same number of wallets per ecosystem. So given that we started to look at snapshots and um, the thing about um, Polygon Avalanche is neither of these ecosystems hugely emphasize staking, certainly not to the extent that Cosmos does. And so when we came up with the airdrop criteria, we worked very closely with our foundations to figure out, okay, what does loyalty mean to you guys? It could be that people are staking, but it could also be in the case of Polygon that people are using their ZK EVM bridge quite frequently. That is a sign of loyalty for them. Um, so we worked very closely to come up with criteria for that. And then for Celestia, it was, this was a uh, Definitely one where we we had to you know think a little bit about how to form this criteria because it's a very young chain. And so how do you define loyalty for a chain that is that young? 
So the snapshot that we generated, it was a balance of, okay, like this airdrop is happening now. And so we have to cut off the snapshot at some point. But at the same time, we want to make sure that people had some amount of time to stake um, before they get included in the snapshot. Uh, and so we worked with the core team there as well to define, okay, like who who gets into this eligibility group. And then for Cosmos, there are a lot of stakers. There are a lot, um, too many to have been included in this airdrop. And so the criteria that we came up with is pretty creative. Um, it was also something that we came up in conjunction with Chris Berniski at Placeholder, which is our lead investor. Um, it is to have stake increase over time. So if you built up your stake in Cosmos through the bear market, you are probably one of the most loyal members here. And so we wanted to definitely reward for that. So that's how we came up with the eligibility criteria for all the stakers. Now for the remaining 2%, that is more community drop. So that was for our innovators, first and foremost. So the people who have been building on Saga this entire time, they've been doing it without any grants. So other chains are throwing money at them, throwing tokens at them, but they chose to build on Saga. And so we wanted to reward them, certainly, for all the work that they've done here so far. We also wanted to uh, help out the games. And honestly, this was when we started to really believe that we could do a publishing house because a publishing house at the end of the day is a user acquisition engine. And we wanted to make sure that we could actually incentivize users to come play our games. So we invented Play to Airdrop, uh, which is a very popular mechanism now within gaming. It's a simple idea. You play the game, so the leaderboards are eligible for airdrops, and in this case, airdrops of Saga tokens. Um, so we ran like 50 plus tournaments probably um, throughout the months of December, January, February, a little bit into early March as well. And the user acquisition numbers were absolutely fantastic. So this was a successful campaign for all the games that participated, but also for the entire community. So that's how we were slicing um, all the individual airdrops. And then we thought, okay, we have to do something for the culture. Because, I mean, we are coming into this having taken a lot of the work that early NFT projects have already done. So uh, we pay tribute to CryptoPunks. Um, so we dropped to Punks, to Bored Apes as well, um, as one of the most OG NFT collections. And then we also airdropped to Bad Kids, um, just to pay tribute to Cosmos. So um, yeah, that's how we came up with the overall airdrop criteria. There will be additional airdrops through phases two through six of mainnet launch. Um, so if people were not included in the original Genesis airdrop, there's still a chance for mainnet launch to, to get an airdrop. And then there's an additional 10% of airdrops after that. So definitely huge emphasis on using this mechanism. Our airdrop planes page is going to live on basically forever, I think, um, given just how central airdrops are to a lot of our community building efforts. And it's not just going to be airdrops of Saga tokens that are going to go through that page. I think for many of our chainlets, our game partners as well, they'll also be using it. So yeah, um, that was a lot, Felix, but uh, I, I think they're, yeah, well, I've been curious about it, so I just want to lay it out there. No, yeah, yeah. again, I think it's like a good example of how much you've thought about this and uh, kind of targeted. So I think, yeah, actually interesting to hear, right? Like, I guess makes sense. Games want to maybe use it. So it's kind of like part of the Saga stack to also get like sort of these features almost uh, delivered to you. Uh, so if you're a game developer, you know where to go. I think we covered everything I wanted to talk about. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on in this short time before launch, Rebecca. And uh, maybe if you want to like some final thing you want to share or where people can learn more or, or anything like that, please feel free to do so. Yeah, absolutely. No, Felix, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's definitely a lot of fun. Always great to catch up with you. And um, yeah, I mean, we covered a lot of territory there. Uh, I, I think that this will be a very exciting period. I mean, heading into the post-launch period, I think people will start to understand how it is that we made our choices for our underlying architecture and then how it is that we approach distribution. So uh, the challenge of Web3 is that so much of, of what we do already has a basis in like Web2 and like, you know, traditional programming, traditional gaming. But what is unique to this particular space? I think that that is the question that has obsessed Saga for, for a very, very long time. So I, I think that with um, the, the system that we've built for infinite horizontal scalability that a lot of app developers are going to figure out, okay, you can do a decentralized system, but it is still eminently scalable. And so it can take on this consumer volume. 
And then in terms of the distribution channels, um, yes, I mean, all the usual ways in which you get user acquisition for a game or for any sort of application, they, they still apply here. So marketing is marketing is marketing. But at the end of the day, Web3, because of the community building aspects and because of the aspects of ownership uh, and control of your own assets and your place within these communities and ecosystems, there are many more powerful tools that you can unlock if you're built on this technology. And I think that um, people are going to very broadly recognize that um, through the campaigns that we run, both here in crypto, um, so people who have been in this space for a long time, but also for for people who've never touched it before. That's That's part of our goal is how do we bring in people this cycle who are, I'm sure they've heard of crypto, they're crypto curious, but they've never actually used any of the products before. That's a huge goal of ours. So yeah, I mean, our our journey really starts now. For a lot of people, you know, mainnet launch is such a huge lift that there's a giant exhale afterwards and people just kind of like, you, you need a little bit of time to recover. I'm sure our team will take a little bit of that as well, but this is really just the beginning. I mean, we're, we're recording this before mainnet goes live, but already there's an extensive post-launch plan. So yeah, we're we're not slowing down. I mean, this has just too much exciting work to be done. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much again. And yeah, best of luck with the launch and hope we're going to see some Saga apps uh, be like among the top most used crypto apps in, in the next few weeks and months. So uh, yeah, exciting. Thanks so much and see you soon. Maybe next year, one year after launch. Awesome. Thanks so much, Felix. Take care. <laughs>